Now, as you're able, would you please stand for the reading of the word, which today will be done by Dustin. Today's reading begins in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Ryan. For those of you that I may not know, it is a joy to be with you here today as we dive into God's word together and explore all that he has for us. God is so good and his planning is just so much better than ours. I'll be honest that I was planning the series months ago and wasn't really thinking about the schedule and the dates. And so I was just kind of walking through this Big God Hebrews 11 series and uh, God in his, in his sovereignty, he ordained that on Mother's Day, we would be talking about the mom of Hebrews 11. And if you think, wow, that was great planning, Ryan. Nope, had no idea that was gonna happen. That is all up to God. So um, praise be to God and uh, I'll try and do better at paying attention to things in the future. But what a perfect day actually to come as we talk about this idea of waiting on God and what it looks like to wait on him because this isn't just about a time frame. It's not just about saying, hey, we have to wait an hour or a day or a week or a month or a year. But waiting on God is really about getting into his presence and acknowledging that, God, we're going to submit our ways, our timing and our lives to you. And how often do moms do that for their children where they're taking care of them and waiting on their kids or maybe waiting on their husband who acts like a child, or at least that's what my wife says about me. Um, but they know what it's like to wait on others and we want to learn from their example and learn what it looks like to wait on God and dive into the scripture and, and explore who Sarah is and, and what this is all about. And so as we talk about waiting, I just wanna acknowledge, I think I'm pretty good at waiting for things. I have been to the DMV before and actually did not get frustrated at one time. So I think that's a, a positive sign for me. I, when I met my wife, she thought I was too young for her. So I had to wait until she realized how amazing I really was. And actually when we were dating, I knew very quickly that, that we were gonna get married, that she was the one for me. It took her a little bit longer to figure that out. I think at this point she's gotten it, uh, that she realizes that we were meant to be. Um, but you know, I had to wait patiently for that timing. And, and honestly, as a Sacramento Kings fan, I have been waiting 19 years <laughs> to see them win another playoff series and uh, the waiting continues. So we'll, we'll see, I'm gonna continue to grow in that. God is sanctifying me each and every year as a Kings fan and using that for his glory, I guess. Um, waiting is, is hard, it's not easy. Most people don't like to do it. Even the ones who are good at it are really just less bad than the others at waiting. It, it's something that is challenging. And in our world and in our culture, it's becoming harder and harder to do because our world is getting better and better about getting you what you want and getting it to you now. Like, do you remember there was a time where we had dial-up internet? Where you were like, hey, I'm gonna be on the internet in one hour. And you were like, listen, like, you know, whatever, all like, and you just had to sit there and wait. And now, if something doesn't load on my phone in about three seconds, I'm like, this is garbage, I need new technology. 
We have companies now that are all about getting you what you want and getting it to you now. You have Instacart and DoorDash where they're promising you what you want, when you want it, which is now. And everything is about moving you quicker and quicker into a place where it's easier and easier for you to get what you want, what you desire in the timing you want. What do we want? Whatever it is, we want it now. And that's the opposite of waiting. And so in a culture, in a world that is screaming, get what you want and get it now, to wait on God and say, no, I'm going to submit my plans. I'm going to submit my ways. I'm going to submit my timing. And I'm going to trust in you and dwell in your presence. And I'm going to move when you tell me to move. And I'm going to do what you tell me to do. That becomes an increasingly challenging thing to do. And so today's text is so critical for us to understand and to begin to learn how to live this out in our day-to-day lives. Now, before we get to Sarah's story, let me just remind you of where we've come from. We're in a series called Big God, which came from a book written by Britt Merrick. And if you pick the book up on Amazon, you'll see that there's a lot that is going to be in common with what we're doing. I've taken a lot from him because I just thought it was so well written and outlined Hebrews 11 in a really cool and powerful way. And so I just wanted to share that with you and make sure that we're aware of that. Now, we started by talking about Abel and Abel was faith worshiping. He sacrificed for God, said, you're worth more to me than everything else. Enoch was faith walking. He agreed to the place, the path, and the pace that God wanted him to go. Noah was faith working. He put his faith into practice and did something for God. And Abraham was faith willing, willing to go where God called him to go, leaving things behind so that he could worship and then be a witness in a culture that was moving away from God. And now we come to Sarah's story. And Sarah is going to demonstrate a faith that is waiting. Sarah is faith waiting. And here's what it says in Hebrews 11 as the text turns away from Abraham and towards Sarah. It says, by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, that being Abraham, and he is good as dead, which by the way, is just an awful, awful way to talk about someone getting old. My dad was here at 9 a.m. and he, it's his, <laughs> this, this is not a sanctified part of the message, uh, but he was, um, he, was, he was here at 9 a.m. It's his birthday today. And, and he came up to me afterwards and, and just told me that I missed a, an easy joke. And he's like, I don't know why you didn't say that your dad now is getting closer to being as good as dead. And I was like, oh yeah, that's true. So dad, happy birthday, you're as good as dead. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Back to the word of God, everyone, all right. So it says, from Abraham came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And so we see that Sarah's faith allowed her to receive a promise that was humanly, physically impossible. And so because of Abraham and Sarah's faith, they were able to experience something from God that seemed impossible. And to get there, they had to do a great deal of waiting. It was 25 years from the promise that we'll read in just a moment here that we read in Genesis 15 to the time when their son Isaac would be born. And in those 25 years, they did a lot of waiting. They did a lot of things right. We're also gonna see they did at least one thing very, very wrong. But they waited on God and trusted that this promise that God had given to them was possible, not because of who they were and what they could do, but because of what God could do. See, waiting on God requires a great amount of faith. Can you imagine waiting 25 years for a promise from God? Can you imagine waiting 25 years for anything? I mean, imagine your boss comes to you and he says, hey, I got good news. I'm going to give you a raise and a promotion. You just have to wait 25 years. Probably not going to stay at that place very long. If you're dating someone and they come to you and they say, hey, I want to get married. We just need a 25-year engagement odds are you'll probably say no. Waiting for any period of time is challenging, but waiting that long is especially difficult. But here's the thing. When we wait on God, we need to recognize that while waiting feels like work, waiting on God does work in your life. Waiting on God feels like work, or sorry, waiting feels like work, but waiting on God does work in your life. 
It's going to transform you. It's going to change you. And in Abraham and Sarah's time of waiting, God was sanctifying them. He was doing things in their life. He was purging them of things that need to be purged. He was strengthening things that need to be strengthened. And when you wait on the Lord, the same can be true of you. We need to wait on God because it does a work in your life. As a matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 40 you're going to see verse 31 on the screen, but I want to read the verses leading up to it because I've just been dwelling on them in these last couple of days and thinking this just needs to be read in completion. In verse 28, it says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And so pause right there and just recognize that God is different than us. God does not faint or grow weary. Anyone grown weary lately? Anyone been tired before? God does not experience these things. His knowledge is unsearchable. His understanding is unsearchable. He is different. He is beyond us. And yet he offers us strength through him. It says he gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. And then tells in verse 30, even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. Now you may not have believed that when you saw the kids choir up here and dancing around and doing their thing. But yes, even youth grow weary and tired. But it tells us this in verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When we wait on the Lord, we can receive a supernatural strength to keep us moving in the direction that God wants us to move, to do the things that God has called us to do. But we have to pause and put all the distractions aside and get into the presence of God and just spend time dwelling with him. And I'll say this right now, that some of us, we're gonna go home and maybe tomorrow or maybe today, we're gonna spend five minutes trying to wait on the Lord, trying to dwell in his presence. And I know, nope, too distracted, there's too many other things going on. Clearly this isn't working. It doesn't work for me. God doesn't want me to receive this strength. It's not gonna happen. Waiting on the Lord takes time. I heard someone say that it takes at least an hour of being in God's presence to fully get rid of all the other thoughts, all the other distractions and really be in his presence. And so if we're going to wait on the Lord, it's gonna take some work. It's gonna take some time, but if we're waiting on the Lord, it will do a work in our life as well. And so as we wait on the Lord, we need to remember that what we are doing is we are focusing on God and on his promises. We're waiting on him. It's not just waiting for the sake of waiting, but to be in the presence of God, to experience him, to trust his plan, to trust his leading and his guiding. And so Abraham and Sarah, they had a promise from God that they were waiting for. And we read this earlier in Genesis 15. I'm gonna skip down to verse two. It says, Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. So he, he recognized that he didn't have his own heir and this was important to him and important in this culture. And he's saying, God, you've said that my family is gonna be a blessing to the nations, but I don't have that family line to pass anything on to. And so where do I go? And then down in verse four, it says, the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. That final phrase is significant because it's not Abraham's work. It's not his good deeds that was credited as righteousness, but it was his faith in God that was credited as righteousness. And many people come to church year after year after year and we think that we have to work to earn our righteousness. But the only way that we can receive righteousness, that we can be declared righteous is by putting our trust in Christ and receiving the righteousness that is his, that he freely gives to those who trust in him. So if you were sitting there and thinking, you know what, I can become a righteous person if I go to church enough, if I give enough, if I serve enough, it never will happen on your own. But the good news is that Jesus has already done the work for you. And so we can receive his righteousness by putting our faith, our trust in Jesus Christ. It was Abraham's belief in God 
that was credited as righteousness, as our faith in Christ, that is credited to our account as righteousness. So when we stand before the Father, he's gonna look and say, all your good deeds, they were like filthy rags. They don't compare, they don't come close. But for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You stand rightly before the Father and you have a place in eternity with him in glory forever and ever and ever. God had a plan for Abraham and Sarah's life and he has a plan and a purpose for your life as well. Now, a lot of us, we want the specifics. God, what am I supposed to do tomorrow? What's my job gonna be? What's my relationship gonna be? Where am I supposed to go? Where am I supposed to head? Can you lead me in these directions on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute, hour-by-hour basis? And if we're in tune with the Spirit, he's gonna lead us in some very specific things. But I wanna talk about some general purposes that God has for all of our lives. And we talk a lot about these, and so you're gonna hear them repeated over and over and over again, because if we can do these things right, everything else falls into place. But if these things, if we, if we can't get these right, nothing else is gonna matter. So the first purpose God has for your life is to love him. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus said this is the first and greatest commandment. God knows you and he loves you. And what he desires most from you is a relationship with you. The God of the universe, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, desires a relationship with you. And so he wants us to love him. He's inviting us into relationship. And as we enter into relationship with him, he says the second purpose for our lives is for us to go and love others. We're invited into relationship with God and relationship with others. And so we get to go and share our faith with other people. We get to go and demonstrate love to other image bearers of God and demonstrate and share the image of God with all these people. So God has called us to be a people who love like Jesus loved us, like Jesus loves others, to demonstrate that love to the people around us. And how do we do this? By making disciples, by inviting people into relationship with Christ and helping them to be disciples who make disciples. Let me just say that again. We want to be disciples who make disciples that make disciples. Like the goal is not just to make disciples and say we're done and we're finished, but to make disciples and help them get to the point where they are making disciples because this is how we're gonna multiply the kingdom of God. I don't wanna just add, I wanna multiply. And we do this by raising leaders up, by raising up the next generation so that they can be disciple makers themselves. God's inviting us into being kingdom builders. We get to be a part of what he's doing. And finally, the other purpose that God has for your life is that he wants you to put your trust in Jesus Christ so that one day you can step into relationship with him in eternity in heaven. And for those who have put their trust in Christ, he is preparing a place in eternity for you. And so these are some of the general purposes that God has for our life, but to live them out properly, we have to wait on God. And there are a few rules that we have to follow when we wait on God. So let me give you some of the rules we need to follow as we wait on God. Number one is this, is that we need to wait without being passive. Wait without being passive. I am in seminary, I'm trying to get my master's of divinity and I'm getting very, very close to finishing up. But I'm not a big fan of school. I really, from about freshman year of high school on through college, I just had a hard time getting to school and being motivated to get my work done. And, and, and actually, when I finished college, I knew that I was going to go back to school and get my master's, but it was something that I just kept pushing off and saying, you know, I'll get to it. And so there was this waiting that was happening as I'm waiting to get my degree and, and to get this degree that I wanted and that I, I felt like God was leading me towards. But in the process of that, I was being passive. I wasn't doing anything. And if you're at the end of, you know, it's, it's, it's near the end of the school year. If there's seniors in the room, uh, high school seniors who are waiting to finish school, but they're also waiting to do the work that will help them finish school, you're going to be waiting for a long time. We're not supposed to wait while being passive, but we're supposed to actively wait and live out our faith on a day-to-day basis. And the problem that many Christians make is we come to church and we continue to be filled up and we think maybe one day down the road somewhere, God's going to use me for his plan. And that someday is today and that somewhere is here and now. God has a plan for your life. And yes, you may need to wait on him to grow in your relationship, to grow in your knowledge, to grow in your understanding of where he's gonna lead you down the road. But today 
you can love God. Today, you can spend time in his word. Today, you can spend time in prayer. Today, you can be in worship. Today, you can love people. Today, as you go out to, to, to celebrate your moms and to do Mother's Day brunch or lunch or whatever you're gonna have, you can go and demonstrate love to the people around you. Today, you can make disciples. Today, you can do the things that God has called you to do. Philippians chapter two, verses 12 and 13 says, therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. What the apostle Paul is saying here in the book of Philippians is not that you need to work for your salvation, but that you get to work out of your salvation. Because of what God has done for you, demonstrate love. Because of what God has done for you, spend time with him. Because of what God has done for you, be obedient to him. We work out our salvation while we look forward to the day where we'll be with him in eternity. There are things we can do here and now, today in our present state. Every follower of Christ, God has a plan for you and a purpose for your life. And many of us, we're missing it because we're waiting passively rather than waiting actively. We wanna wait actively for God. Don't wait, sorry, wait without being passive. That's the way I wanna say that. And the second thing is this, is wait without causing problems. Wait without causing problems. Now, you might feel like you are a patient person, but if you go out to lunch today and the, the, the food takes a long time and it takes 30 minutes before your food arrives, you might begin to get hangry and you might start causing some problems, right? When I'm driving and everyone on the road has decided that today is the day they wanna see if they can break the world record for driving as slow as possible, I start to get frustrated and maybe start causing some problems. Maybe you've been there. When we wait, we can easily start to get to this place where we become impatient and we start causing problems. Abraham and Sarah certainly did. Genesis chapter 16, verses one and two. Just a reminder, Sarai is Sarah, Abram is Abraham. It's the same person. God's gonna change their name here in just a few verses. But it tells us this. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, men in the room, this is a trap. Just say no. Just say no, tell her she's beautiful and you only want her and run away, okay? That's what you need to do here. This is a trap. And I don't even think Sarah knew it was a trap. This was not a setup on her part. This was her trying to take God's promise and God's command and to make it happen her way. But this is not going to end well. Men, also, this is the one time in your relationship where you can just ignore your wife completely, okay? If she ever says something like this, you just ignore it. All right, but Abram decided not to and he agreed to what Sarah said. Down to verse 15, it says, so Hagar bore Abram a son and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So this tells us that this is about 10 years after the promise in Genesis 15. They waited 10 years. That's a long time to wait. Expecting this child, expecting this promise from God. And after 10 years, they got impatient and they started looking around and realizing, you know what? The goal is to build a family. And yes, we have God's way and God's way is to do this together, but we can do this a different way. There's another option. And so Sarah dismisses herself from the promise. And even though it's not explicitly stated in scripture that this promise was from Sarah, this promise was for Sarah as well. It was meant to be for Abraham and Sarah together. And Sarah said, well, you know what, Abraham, maybe this is just for you. And so I'll dismiss myself from the promise. I'll dismiss myself from the plan. And we can make this happen in a different way. As we wait on the fulfillment of God's promises, we wait on eternity. There are so many times in our life where we just get into trouble. 
being a follower of Christ is not easy. There's going to be challenges. You'll face persecution. There'll be hardships. There's going to be things that you have to say no to that everyone else gets to say yes to. And while we wait on the Lord, we need to wait without causing problems. We can't enter into sin because it's easier. And you know what? I don't know when God is going to come again. I don't know when my day is up. But you know what? I'll just kind of follow the world's way for now. And eventually I'll make my way back to to God's plan. That's causing problems. There's ways we could do this as a church. Where we could start to receive the promises of God and, and do things that maybe have a godly end or we think has a godly end. And we start doing it in an ungodly way and it's not going to end well. We as a church could look and say, you know what? We want to reach as many people as we can. So let's dilute the gospel. Let's soften the word of God. Let's not talk about sin. Let's not talk about obedience. Let's not talk about submission to Christ. Let's not talk about the fact that Jesus is the one and only way to the Father. Because then maybe more people will come into the room and then we can just demonstrate love and then everyone will be happy. But that's not what we're going to do because we want to do things the right way. We want to wait on the Lord without causing problems. And in everything we do, we want to do it God's way. And the way that we're going to accomplish this, the way that we're going to avoid the mistakes that Abraham and Sarah made, is if we keep our eyes on God's promises. Third rule is that you need to wait with our eyes on God's promises. We keep our eyes on him and on his promises. Because the minute we take our eyes off of him, we'll start to veer off course. All throughout scripture, there are these examples of people who had their eyes on God and were doing the right thing, and they take their eyes off of God and disaster follows. You go back to the Genesis account in the Garden of Eden, and there's Adam and Eve walking with God, living a perfect life with him. But they take their eyes off God, they take their eyes off his promise and they start focusing on themselves and on the fruit and saying, you know what, the fruit looks good. It's supposed to give us knowledge and power. And honestly, my stomach's kind of grumbling because I'm hungry because the preacher talked too long and I need some fruit in my system. No one's thinking that, correct? Okay, great. And so anyways, they grab the fruit and they eat and sin enters the world. They're banished from the Garden of Eden and everything falls apart. You go to the book of Exodus and you see the Israelites are headed towards the promised land and Moses sends 12 scouts to go and scout the land and they're supposed to just talk about how good this land is and they go and they say, yes, the land is good, but there are people there, enemies there who are too big, too strong, too powerful. We shouldn't go to this land the Lord our God is giving us and an entire generation missed out on the promised land because of it. You go into the Gospels and you see that the Apostle Peter had this moment of faith where Jesus is walking on water and he says, Lord, call me out and I can do the impossible. And Jesus says, Peter, come. And he begins to walk on the water with his eyes focused on Jesus. He is doing something that is humanly impossible. He is walking towards his Lord, towards his Savior, towards Jesus Christ. And then the scripture says that he saw the waves and the wind. In other words, he took his eyes off Jesus. And he began to sink. We need to keep our eyes on God, to keep our eyes on his promise. Abraham and Sarah had a long time to wait. But in Genesis chapter 21, we see the faithfulness of God. It tells that the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God promised him. Abram gave the name Isaac to his son, to the son Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. A hundred years old. It was physically impossible, humanly impossible. But because their eyes were placed on God, the impossible became ordinary, easy. Because God can do the impossible. With God, all things are possible. If we try looking at ourselves, we're not going to make it. 
If we try and operate out of our own strength, we are going to fail. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've been reading in Hebrews 11, and in in a few weeks we'll finish the series actually in Hebrews 12, but I'm just going to read these verses for you. One of them we read at our baptism service, so you already heard this today, and then verse 2 will be up on the screen. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, how do we do this? Verse two tells us, by fixing our eyes on Jesus. He is the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We are here today, not because of our own strength and our own life, but because of Jesus Christ. He is the giver and sustainer of life. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the one who began this in you and he is the one who will bring it to completion. And so we must keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Keep our eyes focused on God and on the promises of God. Because if we take our eyes off course, then our lives will follow. But if we can keep our eyes focused on Jesus each and every day, submitting ourselves to him and saying, every day, Lord, I'm gonna wait on you and refocus my attention on you each and every day, over and over and over again, saying, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you, but it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. If we can wait on the Lord and have that kind of trust and faith and keep our eyes on Jesus, then we can do the impossible. Scripture says, with faith the size of a mustard seed placed in Christ, we can move mountains. Church, we can reach our city, we can reach our state, we can reach our country, we can reach our world for Jesus. But we have to keep our eyes focused on him. We can get to eternity and we can stand before the Father and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, but we have to keep our eyes focused on him. It's all about Jesus. Wait on the Lord without being passive, without causing problems, by keeping our eyes focused on him, keeping our eyes focused on his promises, knowing that he is faithful and good and true. And if we keep our eyes focused on him in that way and wait on him, the things we will get to experience and the life we will get to live are beyond anything we can imagine. There's a world outside that is hurting, that is dying, that is far from God, that is desperate for the hope that can only come in Jesus Christ. And we have the keys to the kingdom and we can offer it to them if we keep our eyes on Jesus and do things the way that he wants us to do. And it starts by waiting on him over and over and over again. Let's be a people, let's be a church who wait on the Lord and see what God will do in and through us and around us. Let's pray. God, you are so, so good. I thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word so that we can know you, so that we can know the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who came, who lived a perfect life, who died on a cross for our sins, who rose again, conquering the grave and offering us life through him. I thank you for the hope that we have in your word and the person of Jesus Christ. I thank you for your love and the way we get to experience that. And God, we are people who are so busy who get so distracted, who are so focused on getting our way and our timing. And God, what we need is more of you. And so let us be a people, let Christ Community Church be filled with people who simply wait on you, knowing that there's nowhere else we can go that has eternal life. Nothing else we can turn to that compares to you. But knowing that when we wait on you, 
you will renew our strength. You will lift us up and help us to persevere. So God, we wanna live a life that glorifies you. And it starts by waiting on you. So help us to be in your presence, to hear you, to feel you, to experience you so that we can be filled by you and do what you've called us to do. We love you, Lord. And we pray things in Jesus' name, amen.